Next up, a man who argues that our collective obsession with Donald Trump is making us miss the boat on a lot of big stories. Andrew Basevich's piece entitled Forbidden Questions outlines 24 key issues he says the Washington elite and the media are ignoring. Among them, one issue that popped up briefly yesterday before it got buried by all those Comey headlines, that is the final proposal for a U.S. troop surge in Afghanistan, where it's been 16 years since American military forces first went in to fight al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Officially, NATO ended combat operations there in 2014, but U.S. troops have remained and now the Trump administration is reportedly considering a proposal to add three to 5,000 more troops in Afghanistan, on top of the 8,000 currently there. The new strategy would give the Pentagon the power to set troop levels and authorize strikes instead of the White House, which currently makes those decisions. Speaking in Denmark yesterday, Defense Secretary James Mattis highlighted the threat Afghan forces are facing. In Afghanistan, we're up against a determined enemy. Uh, as I said, ISIS has been thrown back there. Uh, Al-Qaeda has been unable to amount attacks out of Afghanistan. If approved, the plan would be a reversal of President Obama's efforts to scale back the longest-running military conflict in U.S. history. Trump is expected to make a decision by the end of the month. Joining me to talk about all this and more is retired Army Colonel Andrew Basevich. Colonel Basevich, thank you for coming in. Thank you very much. So Sean Spicer, when he was discussing this possible surge, didn't really want to talk numbers. He wanted to talk and let's take a look at how he put it the other day. The idea of just saying, can we throw X number at it, is not the way that the president's looking at these options. He's trying to figure out, walk back from, from, a, from a goal of, defe uh, of, of eliminating this threat, and then tell me how we get there, as opposed to tell me how many troops we need and then what you're going to do with them. But even though he doesn't want to get into specifics, we are hearing three to 5,000 troops. What would the goal be if we sent three to 5,000 new troops to Afghanistan? Uh, hard to say. I mean, we have had as many as 100,000 troops in Afghanistan. Uh, we've had any number of previous commanders who've come up with their own scheme to somehow fix the problem. You know, I think in your introduction, uh, you made uh, really the key point that, that needs to be made over and over and over again. This is the longest war in American history. Uh, and I think we are uh, justified uh, at this point in viewing with skepticism any new plan announced by any new commander or any new administration. It's really remarkable that it's longer than World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. It just boggles the mind because well, we never hear about but, but, it. But I was gonna, it, it. It boggles the mind that it's gone on this long. It boggles the mind that the American people have basically shrugged this fact off uh, and that at this stage of the game we have yet another strategy. I mean, uh, I, I do not understand what would be a plausible argument uh, that in addition of this quite small increment of additional U.S. forces is going to have any decisive effect. I guess the argument uh, is that uh, in the train and advise and support uh, role that we've been playing for the last several years, that this additional increment is going to inject a level of confidence and discipline and competence in the Afghan forces that they're mm. going to prevail. But again, why, why would one take that proposition seriously? And I can't tell. If the president were to give you a call and say, Colonel Basefitch, I, I know you've been skeptical of this approach, what would you do? What would you tell him? Well, I'd say, Mr. President, what, what exactly are the interests that we have involved there? What, 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 do, what do we need to get done uh, in order to uh, meet our security requirements? What do we need to get done in order to satisfy whatever moral obligation that we have to the Afghan people? And, and then please tell me, Mr. President, hmm. how an additional three to 5,000 troops is going is to achieve that purpose. Right now, do you see anyone from the Trump administration answering those questions? No, and, and, and I, again, you, you, again, you made the key point going in that, that because of the, the president's uh, shenanigans, if I can use that uh, term, sucking so much of the uh, oxygen out of the national conversation, uh, the Afghanistan question mostly gets shrugged off. So we, we, have, we have a decision that is relatively significant in the realm of national security that is going to happen and will be basically ignored. Let me ask you about Syria, which got a lot of attention about a month ago. The U.S. military had hit a Syrian air, air base in response to this apparent chemical attack. Uh, it looked like the the region might spiral out of control even further. U.S.-Russia tensions seem to be at this incredibly intense level. Now, all of a sudden, one month later, 
Uh, there is a Syrian ceasefire that seems to be holding, still pretty new. And you've got President Trump meeting with the Russian foreign minister and ambassador in Washington, uh, a meeting that the U.S. media, i got to point out, were not allowed to attend, even though Russian media were. But that's a whole <laughs> other story for another time. Is it just possible that President Trump's repeated stated desire to work more closely with Russia to, to reach some sort of solution in Syria is bearing fruit there? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, let, let's wait and see if this ceasefire holds. I personally hope it does. I have a hard time understanding how, if it does, Trump or the United States can claim any credit. To tell you the truth, if there's going to be any credit claim, it's going to be credit claimed by Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. uh, and, and Russia. Uh, and although I'm not an apologist for, for Putin and I'm not interested in, in seeing Russia uh, have a more prominent role in the Middle East, if, in fact, Russian diplomatic efforts lead to an end of the Syrian civil war, then we should applaud that because, A, that will be of great benefit to the Syrian people, and, B, it may be a first small step towards restoring some semblance of stability in this region. That's, that's our interest. That's the overarching interest to end the chaos that we helped trigger by our ill-advised Ill uh, invasion of of Iraq back in 2003. Yeah. So if indeed there is progress t towards stability, regardless of who should get the credit, we should all be pleased with that. You wrote in that piece listing 24 big stories that we're missing that Trump, despite his radical talk about foreign policy on the campaign trail, has not been that radical since taking office. But I got to ask you, about some comments that his Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, made not too long ago. Tillerson, Tillerson said, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, that too often in attempting to impose our values on the rest of the world, that we have uh, prevented ourselves from realizing other important objectives. A lot of people saw this as a radical departure from a focus on human rights that's governed American policy, at least in theory, for the you know a half century or more. Isn't well, that? You made, but you made the point. Okay, in, yeah. in, in you theory, caught me there. I in, tried no, to slip in, that in. In 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 theory, I mean, uh, the reality is that we always uh, there's a tension between satisfying concrete interests and in keeping faith with yeah. values. Different administrations uh, parse that in, in, in different ways. Nobody gets it exactly right. Every administration disregards and violates some of our values in some particular cases. Uh, I think the concern was that uh, this president, especially given all the talk about America first, uh, was, was going to completely disregard uh, such considerations, and there's al already evidence that that's that's not the case. I mean, consider uh, the, the 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 famous cruise missile attack uh, in Syria, which, if if we are to take the president's words seriously, uh, was a, a pretty much an impulse decision uh, made, made because, while eating cake, it, because, but because he was personally moved by the the uh, the, the, the video. Of, uh, of innocent Syri Syrians having been, having been killed. Got to ask you very briefly, 20 seconds or less, what are some of the other big stories that we in the media uh, should be looking at that we're missing because of Trump? Well, I think, you know, the assumptions that uh, Saudi Arabia is an, is an ally of ours, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, ignoring the uh, Israeli uh, nuclear capabilities, uh, the, uh, the absence of any real questions about where this so-called war on terror is headed, when it's going to end, how much longer it's going to last, how much longer it's going to cost us. It's not that those questions are totally ignored. That would not be fair. But it seems to me that they are, they are addressed sporadically uh, and never get the attention that they actually deserve. That's a fair critique. Colonel Andrew Basefitch, thank you as always. Pleasure to talk with you. Thank you.